business called RPO Zone. And RTO is the, uh, the Celtic god of uh, bears. And Zen, because I think about things. So the caring bear. Uh, I'm actually in a partnership with Magdalene Mercantile. Uh, they're a big US military dealer that's trying to take over the world because, you know, the word purple, that's their logo. And they put some stuff with me on commission. Uh, American stuff. I do British stuff, because, you know, it's all Britannia. Uh, so what I've got on commission for the paratroops, and what I did is I actually held these to come here for you folks to have first refusals, is genuine wartime windproofs. This one's a very usable size 8. goes over your pantaloons. And keep the wind off your junk. Uh, there's a repair on each one. They're dusty and dirt, but they're honest, a little faded. They want 400 commission on this one. I get like 20 bucks out of that. And then uh, I think these are size 2 or size 1. So first things first, an illicit advert, size two. For a smaller droppable person to go over the pants. Genuine items, where you ready to come by, research the prices. That's what you pay on Facebook or just a little bit less. If you want to have a look at them or wear them, let me know. We'll deal with that separately. This is a show and tell. So I've been an industrial teacher for the last 20 years. And I've taught everything from medical safety through to engineering, how to run a plant badly or well, depends on which one goes shut down, and basically public speaking. So I'm back, I've been retired from that for five years. I've got to say, I've not been around this many people in camouflage for 20 years. I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Would you all mind grabbing a rifle if you could be safe with it and sitting with it appropriately? And that'll carve my nerve, nerve down. So I'm actually an extrovert introvert. Take a minute and go, all right, this will be fun. Which one? Candy bird. Yeah. Can you read that word out? No, it's John. Oh, when he stop changing the words. Yeah. I know you are. Too. Me too. Now we can find out who's rifle trained, right? Do not commit a faux pas in front of a rifle instructor. Let's just say that, shall we? Do not commit a faux pas. No powder faux pas. So originally the Box of Pleasure was going to be a show and tell, but then my friend John found it and he emptied it for me. There's still a couple of things in there. Uh, so I wanted to make it interactive, so call out any questions and clarifications as we go. It's only two hours. I promise you the last hour is a movie about the Canadian Black Watch. But you can't get paratrooper movies, so that's the present I got. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's well worth a watch. It is very veteran intensive if you want to see the other stories. And then um, what I wanted this deck to be is really a gift to the company to add sections because when we met in the previous two years we did brain training training and the brain training got revolutionized went to two man tactics out the movie you guys can do that now i'm kind of glad we're not doing brand again today and merlin challenged me to say hey do something different i'm like well i can do the sniper really well i've specialized in it as a business now and been a fanatic for years for various reasons and i've got an extensive collection um, one day it'll be a museum Somewhere, we'll see. Uh, I trust everywhere. What else? So the slides aren't finished. So what I wanted to do was talk about the difference between a paratroop company and a regular rifle company as it evolved from interbellum through to 41, 42, um, and then the, the launch of the European War. Because it's actually quite an interesting change. It's not straightforward. There's a lot of little facts in there which a veteran would know and just take for granted and probably wouldn't say in the interviews. And I read this great quote the other day, people have been reenacting for a while. Now, I'm gonna mess it up, but if you guys know it, tell me. It's like, if there's no evidence of something happening, it does not evidence it did not exist. So if it makes common practical sense now to do the things we do, and they give a verbal iteration of it, and it wasn't in the manuals, um, sensible people back then would have done it too. It's just never made the books, it never made the training. And the British documentation on how to fight a war was always prolific, but uh, kind of behind the rest of the uh, world. And um, 
they, they routinely took it back to word of mouth every 50 years. What I'm trying to do here is show you that. In the war, they had to document it to proliferate it, but then they uh, took it back to the NCO level to keep those skills within small groups as they shrank the army down again. So, I wanted to add the sniper section. If we could add a mortar section to this one day, there are very uh, other significant differences between regular uh, rifle brigades and color troopers. But here we go. So in 1932, after the First World War, the British redesignated their sniper rifles. They had about 2,000 left from the Great War. It wasn't too great, actually. Um, they were scoped with copies of German Wenzler and other brand scopes, very poor scopes, three and a half bag. Um, they put them on SMLEs, they put them on P14s. There was literally 20 contracts in the Great War for British sniper rifles in the trenches that could do anything, including Galilean sights, which is two separate lenses, front and rear, where the rifle is the scope. Um, the tactics were about emplaced warfare, very, very static, and it was about morale. So at the start of the book, there's the book. This one's dated 1934. Essentially, um, there was three grades of shooter in the British Army. I'm hopefully covering some of that uh, behind me. Uh, first class marksman, second class marksman, third class marksman. They did away with that in 42 and just went to first class only. When I went through, I was a first class marksman. I was in top of the school. Um, but in 1937, if you could hit that at 100 yards, that was enough to qualify as first class. And the rifle was barely capable of hitting that itself. So the definition of sniper has really evolved into like gargantuan science terms in the 90s when it really took off. I left it then. I was a 308 shooter, 762 by 51, uh, out to 1,000 yards, lethal to 800, harassing to 1,000. These guys were uh, lethal to 1,000 with the Mark 7 round. In the First World War, they were harassing to 400. So the range got deeper. There's a three and a half power scope in the First World War. Everybody feeling trustworthy today? Anyone ever seen a First World War Aldis scope? I'll hand it around. It's three and a half grand if you drop it. Have a peek through that. Those that dare. And enjoy. Um, so, out of all the cloud of murk, that was based on a Wenzler, Mer uh, German brand. Three and a half power, really clicky turret, 200, 300, 400, 500, not very far. Really prone to failure in the field. <coughs> Fogging up, very small uh, field of vision. Really <coughs> crap at low lights. So, in the First World War, the British bought a bunch of P-14s from uh, Remington and Winchester. It was supposed to be a standard rifle, but Winchester wanted to be special. It's tied still. And um, they built them a little tighter, some of the parts going into change. The British bought them on contract and put them into store, but they noticed the Winchesters could shoot. So for the First World War, they developed an elevation screw adjustable rear sight and put it onto 250 rifles. They were designated marksmen within the platoon. Everybody else would have an SMLE. These guys could reach out and shoot a guy at 500 with this rifle with the iron sights. The SMLEs could do it in broad daylight up to 400, but this was the, this was the sniper rifle of World War I, the regular P14. This one's Edison, it's got a fat stock on it. I didn't bring the Winchester because my car was full. So if you want to handle World War One era sniper rifle, there it goes. That one shoots two inches all day long, 100 yards, way below the standards of our future. You guys hear me in the back? Can you see me in the back? Good, extroversion is winning. Um, questions? How many designated marks did you make? <coughs> right. But, you know, ask questions. Also a historian. Um, 
Okay, 1932, the British Army reinvents their inventory. They redesignate that as the number three rifle. No number P14, it's a number three rifle. There's 200 Winchesters left with the sight on them, and they scope them. They, do that, they designated the number three WT, and they put it into store. 200 rifles. The attrition on that, getting into 1939, and Mr. Hitler's ideas. There were about 200 rifles in the. Uh, <coughs> right. are, they, are they still scoping with uh, the Albans? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Periscopic prism from First World War done by the, bay, the wayside. It's got that scope on it. Called the number three WT. What do I miss here? And <coughs> there's the mic on it. Right. Does, does WT just mean with, with telescope? Winchester telescopic. Um, 1937 book puts eight men in the brigade under the brigadier in an intelligence section, reporting to an intelligence officer as designated marksman with the free, free WT. Eight men in a brigade. If you look at the equivalent German.